Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Home Games. Um, it's Wednesday, it's 12.30, and you're here, which is a very nice thing. Thank you uh, for doing that after it's been a remarkable few days. Uh, but never mind. And um, But listen, uh, we are uh, all together, and that's what counts uh, on Armistice Day as well. And um, that's a good time to think about what's important and all that kind of stuff um, and um, put everything in a little bit of perspective, maybe, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, I hope you are all doing really well. I'm extremely happy to be joined this week by someone that's spoken at our events before. If you came to DeadX last year, um, DeadX should have been on last week, man. Last Wednesday the 4th uh, was when we were going to do our session in the crypt uh, again for this year and John was a star of last year's one say hello Mr JB well good afternoon everybody welcome citizens nice to see you Mr Paulson nice to see you too like we haven't just been talking for 15 minutes in the green room um, I don't mean to give everybody a peek behind the uh uh, the Wizard of Oz kind of curtain here. Um, but that that's kind of what goes on. Um, so we're going to get into all kinds of stuff, right? The great thing about JB um, is that you never know where your chat's going to go. Uh, the man's a polymath. And if he doesn't know everything, he's exceptionally good at making it up. Um, so we will uh, we'll enjoy that, I think. But investment is our, broadly speaking, our topic today. Um, as ever, jump into the chat, uh, jump into uh, the questions below. I see there's comments about facial hair and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we should probably, John's got proper facial hair. I've got what is, uh, I think, referred to as salt and cayenne pepper going on, <laughs> and it's ginger and white. Um, I've never, ever, ever grown out of beer before in my life and I just hit a point three or four weeks ago um, that I thought I'm in control of literally nothing in my life these days um, I might do this and uh, it has been pointed out to me that if you really want to control your life you should shave because that's controlling it um, anyway everybody hates it um, it could well go any day um, but for now I'm in particularly enjoying the fact that it winds my daughter up um, so there we go um, and uh, questions already starting to come in which is awesome right tell you what um we've always got a little bit of housekeeping we won't do much of it because it's kind of getting less and less first of all this is the first week ever for home games for me where there hasn't been a new t-shirt to wear um because i had to stop because it's ridiculous um so i've got a hoodie but john's got a good t-shirt on this week john show show the boys and girls here there we go sound garden, sound garden. uh fantastic um keeping the side up i've got a, a little hoodie on um but there we go um as ever as ever you may have um buffering not just in your feed but in your life um if so that little um thingy that i just put in the, the chat there will help you out uh magically um there's uh no kind of special notices or anything this week but please do uh, please do join in and we'll see if we can make this um, as uh, fun a session as we possibly can whilst talking about one of the most boring subjects in the history of the world, uh, which is um, investment. Or is it boring, John? Is it boring? Should it, should we be saying it's boring? Is, is this an exciting topic for us to cover? As boring as an American presidential election, Mr. Paulson? Well, you know, I find I'm... I'm glued to it. I love it. I love seeing all these people just saying shit they just don't believe uh, in order to try and maybe curry favour with somebody. And you can see the kind of wheels turning um, and this kind of Trumpian um, way of arguing, which just puts a proposition out there uh, and then says, oh, you would, you know, this is how you'll counter that. And therefore it's invalid because you would say that, wouldn't you? Um, it's kind of classic kind of demagoguery and classic fuckery actually on a, a kind of absolutely grand scale um and just watching people do it live and living color you know is is a remarkable state of affairs i was um, sucked into it i was at like three in the morning and you're like georgia pennsylvania georgia pennsylvania and like the little figures would just creep up you know I mean, I think they have to work on their infographics, you know, um, I think little little horses or something that running along. But um, the whole bipartisan aspect of that and the vociferous nature, as you say, and the way they argue, you know, they argue with each other kind of feels a bit like parts of our industry in terms of like the active passive debate, for example. You can't you can't be in the middle. That's 
that's not allowed. You have to be staunchly one way or devout to the other. That's it. You know, it's like a religious oath that you have to make. And I think our industry has got caught up in that a little bit. So it yeah. says something to me about the state of the human mind and perhaps social media has a lot to do with it. I think it probably does and nuance is kind of dead, right? Um, and I, I, a friend of mine who's uh, I went to uni with, he's a philosophy professor now, uh, and he once said, any argument that brooks no counter argument has to him the smack of national socialism about it and it doesn't matter what the argument is uh and i i, I think i kind of agree with that um so that's us started uh i mean to go on well um nice and light <laughs> yeah, yeah man yeah yeah listen there's not nearly enough kind of dialectics going on in these kind of uh in these kind of sessions so so that's all good Last year, right, um, you came and did DeadX for us in the crypt, which was great right. fun. Um, and you kind of absolutely went for it with the with the theme and your talk was called The Vampirism of Value. Um, and um, just to help introduce anybody to you that isn't familiar with you already, you've written um, a book which you've updated once already and going to happen again pretty soon called New Fund Order. And you've got a very clear way of thinking uh, about the investment industry that I think is really refreshing. So would you hit us up? with kind of your central kind of assertions about what this industry looks like and, and what it's doing and what needs to change. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, what is the new fund order? I think um, if you believe in uh, existentialism, that's possibly one way you might look at the new fund order. It's probably how we address the inherent dysfunctions within finance, within asset management, uh, through the use of technology. Um, but at the same time, there's this kind of dark edge to technology, which, of course, is if we don't address the dysfunctions within the new fund order in the old way of doing things, then we, we ultimately face into obsolescence. So the new fund order for me is kind of this philosophical journey through finance. Uh, and I just use it as an excuse to introduce B-movie monsters and uh, science, science fiction films and spaghetti westerns just to make it a little bit more entertaining. And I think we can all do with that, right? Because it's a it's a heavy game, uh, and um, obviously you got the the book. You're a non exec director now, but you've been fund selector. You've been involved in actually testing out um, this the stuff that we're talking about here. I think it's more it's less kind of IFA world for you, and a bit more in the kind of pension funds and that kind of stuff. Is that right now? It's sort of so. Ninety six. I started at Scottish Widows. Um, doing things like pension scheme, pension transfers, section 32s, people who were around long enough will remember th those good old days. And then what happened next? And I think we're about to repeat that in our industry, which is um, amusing, but also quite depressing. Uh, then moved through, I did self, small self administer schemes. Um, but then I moved to the IFA world in 98 uh, in a compliance role. But it was around 99, 2000, I actually started uh, fund selection, but for a mid-sized IFA, so doing offshore bonds, you know, SIPs, which were a kind of shiny new thing that everyone was doing. Very exciting, then. yeah, yeah. And, and building portfolios of funds and negotiating the commercials and doing the due diligence and the analysis, which, frankly, the advisor community were doing kind of zero because they relied on distributors to do that. Um, which was a, a massive uh, presumption to make because distributors weren't doing it, frankly, uh, and we've seen the consequences of that. So I actually started doing fund selection in the IFA space and moved into asset management in 2003. I joined Franklin Templeton's and then went through effectively asset managers and then found myself back at Scottish Widows in 2010 selecting funds, but for institutional, for shareholder assets, annuity assets. But customer funds as well. So yes, yeah, so I was about 20 years all in doing that fund selection game and probably the last 10 years of that, trying to think about how we do it badly and how we, mm. we could do it better. Yeah, and I, I think the, you know, we're, we're going to talk about some of both this time, but um, we'll maybe look for some kind of reasons to, reasons to be cheerful as well. Um, and so the premise of the new fund order then, uh, you said it really when we were having a practice the other day, which was about not getting eaten by robots or something. Yeah, not dying by autonomous drones, I think. Um, that's for that, was it? That's it, death by autonomous drones. Uh, look, you know, the new fund order basically just challenges the humanity within the industry. And I think, you know, one of the things I called in 2015, which I think was received 
let's just say it received mixed reviews, um, was this idea of peak humanity or peak human intensity within finance. Um, and obviously I was particularly picking on fund selection. So I said at that point in time, there were maybe 5,000 fund selectors and researchers and analysts in the UK and people went, oh, no, that's, that can't be, that can't be right. But you have to remember this was pre centralization this was before we had centralized investment propositions this is when many advisors were still picking funds themselves this was still reflecting effectively the pre rdr world and actually what you've seen in the, the next five or so years is just this huge aggregation of influence fund decision making selection gatekeepers etc cetera, etc cetera. and so now we're finding ourselves with this increasing concentration of not just assets, not just funds, but the decision-making processes that mm. select fund managers. So I think that's a, that was a big core to the new fund order. One of the, the things that got a little bit of coverage, like on say Bloomberg was this um, concept I brought forward called super tanker funds. Now, before really I started talking about that, the whole premise of size-based fee models and the whole ad valorem model that everyone talks about is that big is good. In fact, to be even bigger is better than just being big. And um, what I tried to challenge was that big isn't always best, that actually least on, you know, unforeseen consequences. And I talked about funds like GARS, and I talked about funds like um, Woodford, Mm. And of course, at the time, people are going, no, no, no. Everyone wanted to celebrate the winners. And I think it's interesting in the last few years, we've started to reflect and say, actually, things like Woodford, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. That doesn't mean we're not repeating the same mistakes, but that certainly was a, a big premise of the new fund order. And <clears throat> somebody said to me before, uh, I think it might have been part of the, the Serenity um, paper, which you kindly gave some quotes for, um, that the if there's a systemic problem in here, it probably is with the selectors because that's a pretty much unregulated activity. Uh, well, for those who select funds, and, and, and this is where it gets com complicated. So for those who select funds outside of a fund of fund structure, and what's one of the great trends we've seen in the last few years, money moving out of fund of funds. So they're moving into model portfolio services. Uh, they're moving directly into pension schemes. Uh, they're moving on to platforms and guided architecture. Most of the, those activities, and this includes many of the fund rating agencies, most of those activities are unregulated by the FCA in the way that we would perceive regulation to apply. The accountability of the performance of those funds, if we're thinking treat customers fairly outcome five, you know, do they meet the customer expectation? Um, the reality is most of those people are not accountable and not liable. And more still, they're not actually particularly transparent to the end customer. The end customer is putting their reliance on the advisor. They're putting their reliance on the distributor. And often, actually, the decisions are being made behind the scenes. And I think that's uh, that's a big worry for me. And uh, it's something that we haven't yet kind of fully figured out. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in already. So we'll, we'll jump off our uh, very carefully worked out track. Look, here it is. Um, and uh, let's take a couple of these uh, and we'll go up um, a wee bit earlier. Um, costs and charges disclosure and things like that, John. Uh, now, there's the practical elements to it, which uh, a lot of our uh, uh, viewers will be struggling with day in day out, but I, we, we probably can't fix that. But what do, I mean, in your world and looking at the sector, does the drive to re-disclose pretty much anything you can find to disclose uh, and the assessment of value reports, I think that, that um, John from Sparrows mentions as well, is it doing anything? Is it destructive? In itself, what's your take on how regulations shape and all this stuff? So if you rewind back and you look at the, the transparency movement, um, as it was led by the likes of uh, Chris Sear and Gina Miller and Henry Tapper and Con Keating and those guys, um, 
and even the likes of Daniel Godfrey, obviously, when he was leading yeah. the Investment Association. There's a there's a sort of split within the movement as to what is the best way forward. One philosophy basically says that full transparency is the best transparency for the end customer, for them to be able to give informed consent, that they understand every single cost down to its minutia. The problem with that is our industry is so bloody complex and the fund value chain is so overly complex because it's reflecting a model that hasn't really moved with the times in 30, 40 years. Um, trying to explain that to an end customer becomes almost an impossibility. So the other side of the movement, uh, led by the likes of Dan Godfrey, said actually what we need is just one all-encompassing fee, the bottom line figure. What is the biggest figure you can apply to the annual charge of a fund and give that? It's almost don't give the detail, just give them the absolute biggest number. And I think it's fair to say that the both the regulator and the transparency movement have been have been to some degree divided. And is that part of the problem that leads to almost kind of, you know, not getting there in a, in, a, in a definitive final conclusion, something that actually kind of ticks the boxes, perhaps because we're, I think regulators try and do a bit, a bit of both. The other problem, um, which we can't get out of the way of, is that unfortunately, when you give an idea to regulators, um, regulators have this inherent ability to make it overly complex difficult to interpret, open to interpretation, and leaving in a point where no one is fully happy. And <laughs> I think, you know, that that respect, if you think about what happened after RDR in the UK, as it then led to the, the MIFID regulations in Europe, which has been driving cost transparency, overly complex, difficult to uh, apply, and no one's happy with it. And we've seen that both with uh, the MIFID II uh, cost template that came through, we're going through the same wrangles with the whole, you know, retail packaged um, uh, products template, which we've been talking about for some mm. time. We get to a point where no one can understand it. And so when we're then trying to have meaningful conversations about value, we can't even fully agree on what we mean by cost. And, um, you know, I think everyone's got to look, take some responsibility for that. Advisors, fund selectors, asset managers, distributors, and also the regulators. That's interesting. And um, John's asking, uh, in, in typical style, uh, everybody's saying that their own funds are obviously good value in their their uh, AOV statements. And uh, I'm, I'm applying basic economics here and thinking that can't really be true, can it? Uh, at least on a grading on some kind of curve. Um, I mean, there is a, a smack of bullshit about a lot of this stuff, isn't there? There's it, people trying to pivot this stuff into being marketing uh, uh, collateral when it's, it's meant to be anything. But do you think it will just die as a result? Is this kind of subject to capture by the people that it's trying to regulate? I really hope it doesn't die. Um, to your suggestion, is there a smack of bullshit? I think there's about a truck full worth, worth of bullshit. In, in, in many of the assessment of value reports I've read. Um, think some of that, I think, is unwitting. I think some of that is deliberate. Um, I think the real sadness for me is that the regulator has asked for all fund companies to have a minimum of 2 or 25% of their boards made up of independent non-executive directors. Where are they? Because from most of the reports I've read, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, as, as many have noted, I am something of an oddity. I was an oddity as a fund selector because I was willing to be gobby and talk about things. I'm equally an oddity in, in non-executive land, where I think it's, it's even more a case where non-exec directors are seen but not heard. You yeah. know, their advices are all in the way into the boardroom. They don't try to engage with customers. And I think that's, that's frankly, you know, bollocks because... The FCA wanted these INEDs to be customer champions, to represent the fund holders at the board level. For that to be any way effective, they've got to be able to engage back with the fund holders they're representing. And if you look at those assessment and value reports in the main, do they really engage the end fund holder in a way or are many of them written as an industry report for industry people? And that's where my sadness comes in because that the assessment of value can't afford to be that. It can't afford to be another kid type document. Mm. 
it has to be something that an advisor reads that it's like it is meaningful not just as you say bullshit and is prepared to want to sit down with their customer and talk through the report so the report has to be written in such a way that that is meaningful and um I think year one, there's, I think I talked about it in, in, in my blog, that there's the good, the bad, and the ugly um, amongst the AOV reports. Uh, I still hold that to be true. Um, I think there's some indication of improvement for year two, uh, and let's hope that that continues, because I mm -hmm. think the standard needs to improve significantly from where it was in the first year. I mean, uh, you know, clients of, of you know, the people that are uh, in the chat at the moment are the lucky ones, right? Because they've got somebody that can work on interpreting this kind of stuff for them but i guess the the danger that i see particularly in the, the big survey we just we asked people uh um firms about assessment of value and overwhelmingly people had either said haven't looked not interested or i've looked and it's all a load of old pish um and so it's like a plague on all your houses right it, nothing happens and so the, the work that would be involved for the guys here to spend time interpreting, navigating, and then explaining on what's in these AOV reports, I'm, I'm guessing many of them would say that it's, it's kind of not worth the candle. And there's uh, Simon um, asking a good question there. Um, you know, what even counts as value? What metrics do we use? in order to assess uh, whether something's good value. And it, it's, um, some may use only a low PB ratio and others may include more, more kind of elements. So I guess if you, other than it should be able to be understood by a client, perhaps with minimal interpretation from, from an intermediary, what do you see as kind of a good standard for the sector, thinking broadly now, to hold itself to? So I think one of the things that fun boards um, we'll need to get away from is making sweeping almost abstract statements as to how they generate value without giving any evidence to um, how they derive that. And I think if there's one um, great thing, I, I sit somewhere kind of in the middle on the whole active passive debate. But I think if there's one positive thing that's happened in the last five to 10 years, is this notion of evidence based investing or even evidence-based advising. And I think it's incumbent on fund managers to supply evidence that backs up the statement. Many of the reports were written without that evidence. The challenge then in supplying the evidence, you still got to write it in such a way that people want to read it. And that, that in itself is difficult because let's be honest, as an industry, we're, we're crap at writing things that people actually want to read. You know, And I think we've passed this point of just publishing ever more collateral kind of, and becoming ever more highbrow and therefore more remote to the end customers. And I think we've now reached a point where we say, actually, we now need to improve the way we say things mm. and maybe say a little bit less, but say it better. And I think we are making steps in that, but you know, we're, we're a long way off. So Andy, uh, cheers, cheers, Andy, for that. That He makes the challenge, uh, which you know, it's a classic kind of challenge from, from advisors, which is, mate, my, my clients don't want to know about any of this stuff. They, they delegate it to me uh, to know that. But in a kind of method world, I'm not, I'm not sure that, you know, it's almost like you need to strive to not just let the client do that. They, they will be led to the water and, you know, you can't quite hold their head under it, but not far off. Yeah, I mean, the latest, the kind of latest direction, I mean, ignore ignore for, for a second what might or might not happen with Brexit. Because we can see already um, in the wings discussions about regulations and stuff that are due to come in next year, always being put on a back burner before they work mm. out what they're going to do. But, you know, put that put that aside for a second. Um, you're right, in, in as much as advisors need to read these assessment value reports, that's for me. That's the that is the the first goal of success. Can we actually get advisors to read this assessment of value reports? We've started from a bad place, and the reason we started from a bad place was because the FCA, in my opinion, didn't fully engage the advisor community when they um, conducted the asset management market study. Mm -hmm. 
um, they they put all of their attentions on the fund managers, and I think that was a great mistake. Let's let's remind ourselves that the assessment value is a remedy following that report, so it's relevant. Much in the same way that they failed to engage the advisor community properly in the asset management market study, they failed to engage advisors when it came to the assessment of value in just asking what uh, what they do. So one of the things we do at my firm, where I'm an INED, is that we ask them. Uh, we ask them before we publish a report and we ask them afterwards and we try to figure out how far off the mark we are, we are and then try and make the improvements for the next time. Now, the, some will say the downsides to that is the assessment value report is just a, a once a year process. But I think as long as the firm is constantly thinking about the assessment value, we continue to make, make incremental improvements. And a big part of that is going to be engaging advisors. Yeah. Must be. Um, <clears throat> talking about engaging advisors, um, the uh, Neil asks a, re a really interesting question. It kind of harks back to a slightly earlier point, but I'd, I'd love to pick up on it. Um, about best practices for investment selection for, mo for companies that create models. And models are now, as you said, <clears throat> becoming the way that a lot of stuff's done and if you're going to use a multi-asset fund or whatever it's kind of a little bit down here like this and people for good or ill um, are stitching together these models in dizzyingly kind of different ways um, so you know based on um, your analysis of, of where the sector sits um, do you see like a template that an, a firm who's considering perhaps outsourcing to an investment consultant or something like that, how the hell do they work out what's what and do due diligence almost on, on those guys? Yeah. One of the advantages I had in the, in my old role um, before I retired in 2018, I like to rub in the retired word because I know you and I are about the same age and I just like such a prick, such a prick. Um, the way we went about that, lazy, actually, yeah, well, just yeah. lazy. It's nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Are we finished yet? I know. Is that the time? Uh, <laughs> we assess the MPS providers identical to the way we would assess the fund manager. So right down to all the due diligence. And I had the the pleasure and the displeasure sometimes of looking at many advisor based propositions where they were outsourcing to the MPS. And just too many times you'd find gaps either they would use an actuarial model that was just kind of arbitrarily sourced, but there was no review or monitoring of that or over-reliance on the distributor or not actually conducting any due diligence of any shape or form, frankly, into the investment processes. And the great challenge for advisors when they're using an MPS, which they are acutely aware of, but often the MPS providers are not, is that when the MPS provider makes changes that's going to effectively oblige the advisor to switch out of fund A and move to, swans, uh, to, to fund B, there's no consideration to time out of the market, transition cost, and the, and the mm. overall impact to the customer. The MPS provider keeps ticking along. Is, is every, every single day is the same as the day before, and their performance looks great. The performance of MPSs are not subject to the same standards as funds. So, for example... Why don't we have CFA Global Investment Performance Standards on MPS portfolios? Absolutely. Or, or in fact, on any advised investment portfolio, if you've created a centralized portfolio, it needs to be verifiable. And I think that's a real miss in, in the industry. But yeah, lack of due diligence, a sort of degree of remoteness by the MPS. The MPS provider doesn't see each individual client. And so there's no real... Uh, familiarity or awareness of how the MPS is performing across the client bank. And this is a real problem. And the fund industry was wrestling with this like as far back as sort of 2000, 2005. And Fidelity put out the famous Magellan study that just showed that the average performance of the fund was hugely different and it varied greatly across its investor bank. And I think MPSs and advisors need to think the, the same way as many of the things that we do for the fund industry and an investment due diligence we do on fund managers. And uh, it's a couple of, uh, I think people um, agreeing vociferously with you there, um, Simon and David, both coming up with um, some practical things uh, about uh, the regulation of models, um, which, I mean, models don't exist, right? They're like a virtual carrier yeah. bag to yeah. tote funds around in. Um, and so, no, they're not regulated. 
uh, which I guess is part of the great joy for those that do them. Um, speaking as an unregulated person myself, I love being unregulated. It's brilliant. I uh, heartily recommend staying unregulated for as long as you possibly can, whatever this is it is the you point, do. This is the point where I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll mention I'll be lobbying hard to regulate people like you and agencies and research. Um, no. God, we really are out of time. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. We've got to Kate's got to go now, so I think we should probably just stop. Um, <laughs> but it's, not just, it's, not just, it's not just those, those who occupy... Kind of the, the support and the research of the industry, right? And that, you know, that, that there's many facets to that that you have to work through. It was also what I found with the big pension companies, and the reason that Prips, as as the FCA brings it in, is such a nightmare for pension companies, was that many of these uh, default funds were made up of building blocks that the pension company already had, mm. and then they would sort of synthetically put them together to create portfolios. Right, and then it's like, well, this is fantastic. And I landed at my previous shop, and this was prior to retiring in 2018. Um, did you retire in 2018, John? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I like to call it semi-retirement, which is basically retirement, which means I don't have all the stresses because I've already lost the hair, so that's 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 gone, right? Um, but I'm determined I'm going to have less grey than you do. But um, but at the same time, at the same time, I have to be mindful of the, of the monthly cash flow. So I would describe it as semi-retirement. But anyway, getting back to my story, the pension companies were often calculating the value of these portfolios on an Excel spreadsheet. And I landed, and in my first role when I landed um, back at this company that I won't now name, even though I've already named it previously. And Pretty everyone sure you that have, before. yeah. So that's it's fine. That's a busted flush. Um, all the best, all the best. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't sign off the spreadsheet. And I said it was a huge risk. And I actually said what should happen is that the custodian should calculate a synthetic nav so that we had accurate pricing mm -hmm. from one day to the next. Yeah. Obviously, that went down like a fart in an elevator. So that wasn't, you know, but now because of preps, they're going to have to do exactly that. In many ways, MPSs are, are no different. But it, there's, there's a lot of analogies to be made with, if you remember, the investment consultant review that they the Competition Markets Authority conducted, which is this idea of investment advice and allocation decisions and allocation research being supplied to scheme trustees. Now, the scheme trustees were liable for the performance of the scheme, but these consultants and advisors were not. And this is when the FCA introduced this sort of term or the CMA introduced this term of fiduciary perimeter. Mm. And I think you know, there's so many analogies to be made between what investment consultants do in the pension and institutional space and what MPS providers and fund rating agencies do in the wholesale space. And why are we thinking about these things differently? So I think the FCA needs to take a leaf out of the CMA's book, look at the findings of that, and actually you know, port those across. And when I was still um, part of the Association of Professional Fund Investors, uh, that's what we lobbied heavily to the CMA as part of our uh, response to that consultation. So it feels like that's a job still to be done. Yeah, I mean, I know, you know, to to uh, Simon and David's point there, we, we ran a kind of wave study for three years, um, which we called Never Mind the Quality, Feel the Width. And it was trying to draw lines of suitability from either multi-asset funds or um, MPS uh, propositions to client groups. And I was kind of pre-prod and method, but it was very clear that people were saying, well, I use multi-asset funds for kind of clients who are more modest portfolios and for my better guys i use the the mps and so we said okay well let's unpack it then and see if we can work out why that is and if anything is more suitable and the answer was nobody knows because it's you, you can't demonstrate it either way right so um pick your position and defend it to the death and we're back to where we started with uh, never giving ground or, or admitting nuance um but one of the things that struck me is do during doing that and i think steve's on uh, in the uh, on the call at the moment, and he did a lot of the analysis. Was it's absolutely brutal getting data out of the MPS sector? It's really very, very difficult, and the reliability of the data, I'm not sure, is right up there. And even worse than DFM MPS is advisory MPS, 
where if you're lucky um, to David's point, you can get the platform to give you something. Um, but that will be driven by an individual investor and when they plopped in. Uh, and oftentimes, depending whether they can do time weighted or just money weighted uh, stuff about what comes out of there. And so the, the kind of um, measurability on a sector wide level of these propositions, which are taking 30, 40% of flows now, maybe a little bit more, um, is close. I'd say it's pretty close to, to zero. Uh, so, um, Neil asking down there does anyone know if the same kind of equivalent standards will be extended to life and pension funds eventually well i think you, you've mentioned prips and stuff already but the extension question neil is whether it gets extended to these kind of virtual structures in their own right yeah i'm, I'm just blown away because you're using uh big words like variability which is uh just just thrown me there Mr. i don't know what they mean um <laughs> But I'm an English graduate, right? I, I mean, I don't have to know what I'm talking about. It just doesn't make it sound good. And, and you do it very well. Um, look, you know, it's it's a bit like it's a bit like you remember when absolute return funds became incredibly popular because it was seen as an elegant solution to a, almost a universal problem, which was we want market return, but we don't want the the, the volatility and the risk mm. that comes with it. And it was a hugely elegant. Uh, position and I remember when um, a, a particularly large absolute return franchise um, belonging to a uh, mutual, well, it was an ex mutual society as it was by that point, uh, which sold great guns. Um, and I remember um, some advisors thinking that the G standard for st uh, stood for guaranteed, guaranteed, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was a cracking one. Um, <laughs> And, and to be fair to that company, they were terrified. I mean, they worked very, very hard to try and know, stop people thinking of that. I know, I know. But you know, we saw that we saw the volume, you know, the voluminous flows going into that. And I think everyone kind of knew that the due diligence and the uh, the discretion and the analysis of those flows going in probably wasn't what it needed to be. And I think we can we can observe the behaviour when you know the fund did X and markets did Y and you suddenly see the hemorrhaging flows back out again to know that perhaps some people didn't know what they're buying into and some people don't know what they're, they're selling out of. And I think there's probably a similar point with MPSs um, because there's a lack of transparency. It's very hard to do the due diligence in the first place, but also you've got to know what due diligence you want to go after. Mm. And um, I think, Sometimes people think the due diligence is just all operational. Now, that's an important part of it, but a lot of it comes down to the investment process. And I'd say, you know, 80% of MPS based propositions that I saw in my old job uh, weren't fit for purpose based on the criteria I set. Um, and what we were looking for there is, you know, customer comes along, and what they want is they want to. Put their money into an investment strategy and it to generate wealth or income and be able to then get something at the other end they don't necessarily make the the conscious decision of whether that's going to be expressed through a mutual fund a, a unit linked fund or an mps mm. you know that decision's often often um decided for them by the advisor and I think one of the things I observed with many advisor based propositions, and you know, we've got to be careful not to generalize here, was there sometimes were conflicts of interest in how the, the model portfolio service was uh, incentivized, remunerated, and what the fee model of that was relative to the advice component going into the MPS. Um, so maybe in that respect, outsourcing is a good thing. But of course, once you outsource, you've got to come back to that due diligence, and it just isn't yeah. there. And there's nowhere really for advisors to go easily to get independent, verifiable information on MPSs or any easy way to compare them. Um, that's just where we are. No, it makes, makes absolute sense. Listen, when we were talking uh, earlier in the week to come away from, from MPS for a bit, we were talking a little bit about some interesting stuff about hearts and minds of advisors uh, and uh, about what the investment industry, uh, the kind of narrative that it puts out and the maybe a bit of a disconnect between that and then the narrative that advisors have with their clients. So tell me a little bit about what you think is going on uh, inside that kind of gap between the two. Well, if you think about 
what happened to asset management within the UK post Big Bang. Um, it effectively moved towards an American model of asset management. That's essentially what we did. That model is hinged on um, fairly right-wing capitalist theory. You know, it very much pulls from the, sort of the, the Hegel, uh, uh, Austrian school of thinking, right? What's happening now is, um, to some degree, some sort of social conscience. You know, Adam Smith would have a, have a field day, probably, what's happening in asset management today. But this idea of social purpose, that asset management, I think, for, for many listeners on today, for many of us, it's about providing futures for, for customers. And I think that idea of purpose, um, I think, makes us feel pretty good about what we're doing. But the reality is that we're actually within an industry that is that is hinged on pretty right-wing doctrine. And what we're trying to, build, to do is pull it left to try and supply that social purpose. And that's why I think we're getting into so much difficulty with uh, sustainability, environmental social governance, because the default is we have to maximize profit and maximize returns for our customers, because that is our baseline purpose. To, to maximize the returns for our customers. But at the same time, now we're being asked to deliver on a, a value to society and to try not burn up the planet. And these things are pulling effectively a, a model that is very right hinged, all about really profit and returns, and it's, it's pulling it left into a more left doctrine, you know. Um, not for me to, to cite Marx, although I, I do from time to time, but that's that's what we're facing into. We're actually facing something that's asking us: should um, asset management funds portfolios should it be more about a sort of social purpose? Mm -hmm. um, and I, as much as the platitudes, I think, and in, in, in the goodwill, people would like to think that's what we're doing. We're not really actually doing it. So there's there's an argument that uh, everyone will have heard, I'm sure, that says, well, actually, the two things end up being the same uh in the longer term in that if you know the the funds that bother to find investments that aren't burning up the planet and are treating people in a, a good way and whatever these are the companies that will be successful in the longer term and, and it'll all work out so actually it's a false distinction the left and right stuff doesn't exist anymore in that in that way um what do you too long term do you think for that to be true I certainly don't think we're there at the moment. I mean, if that was true, then we would um, invest, you know, this is all about the allocation of capital. We would invest in companies in such a way that promoted, first and foremost, social worker rights and labor laws. Uh, and that's not what we do. What we're actually, if you, you know, if you look at the last few years, one of the greatest trends is that people have invested increasingly into the US, into big tech stocks. Um, that has also coincided with this period of the destruction of labor laws in the U.S. And actually, we're investing in companies that instead of preserving jobs are actually making jobs redundant. I mean, COVID notwithstanding, because that's that's quite an exceptional. But this, this trend was happening before COVID happened. We're seeing human intensity reduce within companies. Um, we are investing increasingly overseas rather than investing in the UK on a ticket of ESG and diversification. So when we start to think about if we're all interlinked in one great economy, workers, capital allocation, all that kind of connects because that's what ultimately forms productivity within your country and, and well-being. But we're divesting billions overseas we can't for a second think that these two things are somehow mutually exclusive. So we're, we're basically, we're, we're, we're waving the flags for purpose and for ESG. And at the same time, we're investing billions overseas. That's mm -hmm. going to have a direct impact on workers within the UK because we're, we're effectively divesting capital. Now the counter argument is that there's always someone on the other, the other side of the trade mm. but that doesn't stop price suppression. And I uh, saw so one piece of research that was really interesting that for the first time, overseas investors owned more of the UK market than UK investors did. Now, when that you start to get that tipping point, your, 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 your future is really at the behest of others. 
And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting with the investment committees today, you know, I see it, and, you know, part of them, that we are trying to make the best decisions we can to protect the returns and the capital and the income of our uh, members and our customers. But we're taking long term decisions that might actually have a detriment to their mm. future earnings and their future uh, well-being. So these things don't connect very well. And I think, again, this just comes down to if you look at most portfolio allocations today, the theory of those were, writ were written 50 years ago and they were written on a very right wing capitalist model. So a lot of the actuarial thinking, stochastic modeling, all this good stuff, the capital asset pricing model. Absolutely. None of that, none of that really addresses the social impact of investment decisions. And so I think this is something we have to wrangle with. And, you know, I don't want, I don't want to come across as a, as a Marxist, although that probably that ship sailed. Um, but I do think we have to think about the purpose of our investments for our clients in a much broader way. Listen, famously left-wing crowd when you've got a load of advisors on, mate. You're, you're absolutely on safe ground there. Um, we need to draw to a close by, uh, you know, a couple of guys putting a very kind of understandable practical challenge down, which is great, but I've got to sit in front of a client, right? Am I going to talk Gaia theory um, and the interconnectedness of all things and, and all that kind of stuff? Probably not. Um, so I guess this is one of these things that the kind of big actors in the industry probably grapple with and then it it kind of trickles down a little bit in a Friedman kind of way because I said we get some Friedman in. Always good to get Friedman in, you know, just just look up and wait for the money to fall down. So. That's right, it trickles, it really does. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, this year is the greatest example of Friedman economic thinking in history. Yeah. Because he was, he was basically considered a banjo up until this year, <laughs> right? So for the first time, and we've seen right-wing administrations having to enact Freeman. America was one of the first countries to give $1,000 to everybody. That's pure yeah. helicopter money right there. So for me, that means anything is, anything is doable. You know, we're yeah. at that point of if the, if the fear of the risk or the, or the sense of the purpose is great enough, we, we, we already show that we're prepared to change the capital model. We've done it for COVID. Do we do it for climate change? Do we do it for a post UK Brexit? So these are, you know, and I get that these are difficult conversations to have with clients, right? I think what we actually advisors want to do with clients is actually talk about how the money's being invested. I think we've spent many decades talking about your money's going into this fund. Okay, actually, when the money goes into that fund, does it go into what? BP, Shell, Exxon, JP Morgan? Where's the money going? I think if you start that kind of conversation, mm. that gets us a bit further forward. Brilliant. Um, we're, we'd, better sh we'd better stop. We'd better shut up um, because we're, we're absolutely our time. And uh, I think, you know, I could keep going for hours chatting away. It's um, As always, it's great fun. And um, I hope everyone's... Uh, I mean, maybe not hilarious at all points, you know, but we've covered more theory in 45 minutes. Uh, and I have to say, if you were kind of bringing somebody through and saying, right, get to grips with the investment sector a little bit, and they could do a lot worse than, than listen to John for 45 minutes. Um, you've got a couple of things to plug. You've got a podcast starting up pretty soon, John, and that's I've seen some of the trailers for it. And you've given absolute free reign to your, uh, uh, your B-movie proclivities. Yeah, so the podcast is all going to be about the perspective of uh, the fund selector, fund management, the advisor. Um, it's going to be an idea to try and capture some of the market news and the latest and greatest that's happening, but try and put a contrarian spin on it, a bit of opinion, a little bit of kind of punchy interviews. But yeah, basically uh, push the envelope out, 25 minutes of your time, I think every two weeks uh, and try and stir it up a little bit. So that's going to be the podcast. And hopefully uh, either December or January, uh, we'll try and get that third installment of New Fund Order out there as well. And uh, just to remind, remind everyone, the first chapter of that book started with the vampirism of value presented at DeadX last year. And that was a huge amount of fun. Great stuff. Um, Amazon for your book, of course. I obviously expect 15% commission because it's all about commission apparently these days. Um, and uh, that's it from us. Next week, Steve will be back uh, with a very, very different guest. And I, I, I won't spoil it, but I really want everyone to tune in. It's not an industry person uh, for the first time in home games, but it's going to be 
Amazing. Um, thank you so much, as always, for your input and your questions. JB, thanks so much for doing this. Um, and uh, we'll leave you to your weeks. Lancat out.